and welcome back to another episode of Cinema History. Today we are going to be talking about... Why am I opening it that way? Let's just hop into it. I'm going to get my hair out of the way. James Maitland Stewart was born on May 20th, 1908 in Indiana, Pennsylvania. The town of Indiana in the state of Pennsylvania. To parents Elizabeth and Alexander Maitland Stewart. He was the oldest child. He had two younger sisters, Mary, who was born in 1912. His other sister was Virginia, and she was born in 1914. The family had been in Pennsylvania for several generations, and his father, the father, Alexander, ran the family hardware store, J.M. <laughs> J.M. Stewart and Company Hardware Store. Jimmy was expected to take over the family business when he finished college, but he dreamed of becoming a pilot and joining the Navy. They have pilots. Anyway, in childhood, Jimmy was shy, and he would build model airplanes and practice the accordion in the family's basement. He would daydream in school and he earned average grades. His father wanted him to have the best education possible, so he sent him to the Mercersburg Academy Preparatory for high school where he competed in track as a high jumper, was a yearbook editor, and a member of the Glee Club. I can't talk while doing makeup on my chin. <laughs> he was a third string football player due to his slender build. And just a skinny, skinny dude, even in childhood. <laughs> he was supposed to graduate high school in 1927, but he contracted scarlet fever and it ended up developing into a kidney infection. And so he was out of school for a while, and he graduated instead in 1928. And from there, he went on to attend Princeton University. He majored in architecture, finally excelling in his studies. I'm actually not sure how well he did in high school. His, when he was earning average grades, that was said of him in the lower, you know, elementary, junior high. I don't believe it says necessarily how well he did in high school, but obviously he did well enough to get into Princeton. So he majored in architecture, he did very well, and he earned a scholarship for graduate studies based on his thesis, which was a design of an airplane hangar. Remembered, he wanted to be a pilot, he made model airplanes, so he designed an airplane hangar, that was his thesis. So he earned this scholarship, but instead of using it to continue his education in architecture, he decided to join an intercollegiate summer stock company called the University Players. And they would perform in West Falmouth, 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 <laughs> Falmouth? I don't know, Massachusetts, which is on Cape Cod. There he formed a lifelong friendship with fellow summer stock player, Henry Fonda. Sometime in there, he moved to New York with some of the other summer stock players, members, and he had a little bit of success, but really not very much. And it was, it was such that he was kind of reconsidering his career choices. He thought about going back to school and continuing his education. But before he could decide absolutely to do that, he was cast in 1934 in the lead titular role of Yellow Jack, which premiered at the Martin Beck Theater in March of that year. The critics loved it, but audiences did not and the show only had a three-month run, so <laughs> not that good. That summer, 
Jimmy also had an uncredited role in the Shemp Howard, as in Three Stooges, Shemp Howard, a short comedy film, Art Trouble. And he acted in some more Summerstock productions. And then in the fall, he had more critical success with Divided by Three at the Ethel Barrymore Theater. Hmm, <laughs> fancy. After his 1935 run in the play A Journey by Night, he signed a seven-year contract with MGM Studios, debuting for them in a Spencer Tracy vehicle, love Spencer Tracy, The Murder Man, that same year, 1935. After several bit parts, University players' pal and ex-wife of Henry Fonda, Margaret Sullivan, campaigned for Jimmy to play opposite her as the leading man in the Universal Studios picture Next Time We Love in 1936, which was a box office success. And due to this film, it was predicted by Time Magazine that the chief significance of the film in the progress of the cinema industry is likely to reside in the presence in its cast of James Stewart. Wow, that's something. They're saying he is going to be influential in cinema. They're already predicting that, his first major movie role ever. So that's cool. That's what I would want said about me if I was in a movie, you know. <laughs> like, she's gonna go places. Anyway, so he did have a few more successes that year. One flop of an outing in the musical genre. And then he handily redeemed himself with an emotional climax in the film After the Thin Man. 1937 saw more success and failure. But overall, critics really liked him, and they saw him as a promising addition to MGM Studios. But MGM was still hesitant to cast him in any of their own projects. Up to this point, they had been loaning him out to different studios, and they continued to do so. In 1938, for Columbia Pictures, he starred in Frank Capra's You Can't Take It With You, opposite Jean Arthur, who would act opposite him again in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington the next year. Why did I say it like that? 1939, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. You Can't Take It With You also featured Lionel Barrymore, who would go on to play the cold and malignant Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life. This is what we call foreshadowing. You Can't Take It With You launched Jimmy's career. I mean, you'd think the other ones did, but really, this was like, boom. The critics were right about him. In 1940, he starred in the Ernst Lubitsch... Lubitsch. That's a terrible name, but that's, that's it. Okay, anyway, the film was The Shop Around the Corner. And if that sounds familiar to you, it was a romantic comedy which was later remade with Judy Garland and Van Johnson in the film In the Good Old Summertime in 1949. And then in 1963, it was adapted into a Broadway musical called She Loves Me. And then You've Got Mail in 1998 with, of course, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. All of the films were based originally on a play called Parfumery. I don't know how to say that. Parf parfumer Parfumery. <laughs> That's great. By Miklos Lajlo, which was acknowledged in the credits of You've Got Mail. Nora... Nora something? Efron, I think, directed You've Got Mail? Anyway, she's good about crediting people put it that way. Jimmy's final film in, of 1940 was George Cukor's The Philadelphia Story with Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn. I flipping love that movie. It is hilarious if you've never seen it and it's very sweet. If you haven't watched it yet, watch it, okay? Just watch it. It's fabulous. And that film 
earned Jimmy his only Academy Award for Best Actor, beating out his friend Henry Fonda in his film, The Grapes of Wrath. Big deal. Jimmy gave... that sounded sarcastic. It was a big deal. Jimmy gave his Oscar to his father, Alexander, who displayed it in the hardware store, the family hardware store, next to other family awards and military decorations. Isn't that adorable? I love it. Okay. The Stewart family had military roots and had served in several wars. His grandfathers, both of them, had fought in the Civil War, and his father had fought in the Spanish-American War and World War I. So Jimmy tried to enlist before the United States even entered World War II in November of 1940, but he was underweight, so he was rejected. And with the help of a friend who gave him some advice, he got his weight up and he re-enlisted. Well, I mean, he didn't technically enlist. He tried to enlist, and then he did enlist in February of 1941. He enlisted in the Army Air Corps, and he was the first Hollywood actor to join up. Jimmy was first relegated to making newsreels and doing public relations stunts because he was an actor in the Army's motion picture division, but he demanded to be sent to fight. He didn't join the military so he could make movies. He became an actor to make movies. He joined the military to go fight. He was almost 33 and therefore too old for the aviation cadet training. I should be doing my makeup right now. One, one, one. But because he wanted to be a pilot, he had been working on it as a private citizen and had logged 400 flight hours already, just on his own, doing his own thing. So he applied for a commission based on his flight experience and his education. You know, he had a degree, so usually you can get a commission as an officer in the military. So he was promoted to second lieutenant in 1942. I'm talking probably way too fast. Oops. He trained new pilots in New Mexico for a year and was then sent overseas to fly B-24 Liberator bombers over Nazi-occupied Europe. Jimmy Stewart, as a pilot in the Army Air Corps, flew 20 missions at a time that generally air crews were expected to be killed between 8 and 12 missions. They just didn't have a long shelf life. Combat in the air was new since World War I. You didn't last very long, but he flew 20 missions, obviously survived. He was awarded two distinguished flying crosses for air medals, a presidential unit citation, and the French Croix de Guerre. Do you roll that R? De Guerre? So, anyway, Jimmy stayed in the Army until 1942 when the Air Force became an independent branch and he moved to that. So he went from Army Air Corps to, I don't know if he had to apply for it or if they just naturally kind of shunted him over there because he was already a pilot. In the Korean War, he flew B-52 bombers, and then in Vietnam, he flew as an observer in bombing missions. And then he retired as a Brigadier General from the Air Force on May 31st of 1968 at the mandatory retirement age of 60 years old. So he stayed in as long as he could. Francesco Rosario Capra was born May 18th, 1897 in Bisaquino, Sicily, Italy to Salvatore, a fruit grower, and Rosaria Sara Nicolosi. Francesco was the youngest of seven children. The name Capra means goat and is the word from which capricious is derived. Capra biographer Joseph McBride noted that the name neatly expresses two aspects of Frank Capra's personality, emotionalism and obstinacy. The Capra family emigrated can't talk. Why? 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 The Capra family emigrated to the US in 1903, finding cheap passage, the cheapest passage possible in the steerage compartment of the steamship Germania. Capra later described the 13 day voyage as one of the worst experiences of his life. Crammed with 
all these different people, there was nowhere to go, so he had no privacy, and it was two weeks long, so. He was five years old at the time. He recalled his father, Salvatore, exclaiming at the sight of the Statue of Liberty, Chicho, look! Look at that! That's the greatest light since the Star of Bethlehem. That's the light of freedom. Remember that. And he did. Francesco grew up in L.A., in what is now Lincoln Heights, and was, at least at the time, something of an Italian ghetto. That's how he described it. Don't come for me. That's what he said. <laughs> Salvatore went from being a fruit grower to a fruit picker, and Francesco worked as a newsboy until he graduated from high school. He worked his way through college doing odd jobs, and he studied chemical engineering at the California Institute of Technology, graduating in 1918, two years after his father had passed away in an accident. In 1918, Francesco was commissioned in the U.S. Army as a second lieutenant. He taught mathematics to artillerymen at Fort Point before contracting Spanish flu and being medically discharged, returning home to live with his mother. He took the name Frank Russell Capra in 1920 when he became a naturalized U.S. citizen. Despite being the only member of the family with a college education, he found it extremely difficult to hold down a job, and this made him feel like a complete failure and led to bouts of depression. After recovering from, somehow, recovering from an undiagnosed, it says burst appendix where I found it, but maybe it was just undiagnosed appendicitis, and you, I don't know. It was a bad situation, could have died, obviously. Um, after that, after recovering from it, he wandered the western United States, taking odd jobs as a farmhand, movie extra, oil stock salesman, he just did everything. And he played poker sometimes to make money too. I don't know how good he was at poker, but he, he did attempt it at least. I don't play poker at all, don't know how. At the age of 24, Francesco, now Frank, he directed, at age 24, a 32 minute long documentary called La Visita dell'Incrociatore Italiano Libia San Francisco. That's as good as it's gonna get for now, okay? At 25, he took a job as a book salesman, and at some point while he was doing this, he saw a newspaper article about a new movie studio opening in San Francisco, and he called them up and completely lied about his film experience, embellished wildly, because he had only directed the one little documentary in order to get a job. So he's like, I have all this film experience, hire me. And they did, they hired him. They gave him $75. Um, I think the guy's name was Howard Montague. Something Montague, I think Howard. Paid him $75 to make a one reel silent film and Frank made it in two days with one cameraman and a cast of amateur actors. So, cool, he did that. This gave him the little boost of confidence that he needed to work in the industry, and he worked from this point on to find more openings in the industry. So for producer Harry Cohn, he worked as a film cutter, property man, and assistant director. Property man being like props, the props in the film, the things that they use. I don't, I'm like doing little hand motions down here. See them, so I'm, <laughs> property, the things that they use. That's the... Okay, never mind. He worked under Max Sennett after that as a gag writer. I think it was our gang that he did that. And then comedian Harry Langdon wanted to leave Max Sennett, his production, whatever, to work on full-length feature films, and he took Cabra along with him as his personal writer and director, and he did that with First National Studios. I'm not sure exactly when, but Capra and Langdon had a falling out, and Capra went back to Harry Cohn's studio, which was now named Columbia Pictures, in 1928. And almost all of Capra's classics would be filmed there. Hmm. Unlike most filmmakers at the time, 1928, 
Capra was open to sound recording technology because his engineering education made him more confident about it. He wasn't intimidated like other directors and studios were. He was actually thrilled to make the transition from silent films to talkies because he said he never felt at home in the silent films. Frank experienced great success in the 1930s with his 1934 film It Happened One Night winning Oscars for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Adapted Screenplay. The film starred Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert and was an escapist screwball comedy in the midst of the Great Depression. So people loved it. it. Made him feel happy for once about something. Can you relate? After that, Capra switched gears, wanting to use the medium of film to convey messages to the public. And he was inspired to do this by a Christian scientist friend who had encouraged him that his talents were God-given and that he ought to use them for God's purpose. Capra would explain, my films must let every man, woman, and child know that God loves them, that I love them, and that peace and salvation will become a reality only when they all learn to love each other. Thus began the era of Capricorn, you know, like corny Capricorn with the director making films that were focused on themes rather than on people. As World War II was ramping up in Europe, Capra had begun production on a satire of government officials starring James Stewart, his new muse actor. The U.S. ambassador to the U.K., Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., wrote to Harry Cohn pleading with him not to play such a film in Europe. He and many other public officials were extremely concerned that the messaging would lower the Allies' morale in the midst of World War II and damage their perception of the United States. They also, of course, were not really ecstatic at the prospect of a film that may influence audiences to view government officials negatively. Can't have that. Definitely can't have that. We can't have people questioning our authority. Anyway. Capra campaigned for his film, believing it to be crucial for the film's message of American ideals of democracy to be shared in such a time of crisis. This film, of course, was Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. He said, R. Jefferson Smith would be a young Abe Lincoln. This is very heavy in the film, actually, a heavy theme if you've never seen it before, which you should. Everybody should watch that film. It's great. R. Jefferson Smith would be a young Abe Lincoln, tailored to the rail splitter's simplicity, compassion, ideals, humor, and unswerving moral courage under pressure. Capra and Cohn finally agreed to release the film as originally planned, meaning also in Europe, and it was nominated for 11 Academy Awards, but it only won one for Best Original Story, having been up against Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. Tough competition there. Critics said of the film, however, that audiences left theaters with an enthusiasm for democracy and in a glow of patriotism. Same. Same. That's how I feel watching that movie. So go watch it too. Within four days of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Frank Capra had quit his career giving up his presidency of the Screen Directors Guild, and received a commission as a major in the U.S. Army, determined to prove his patriotism for his adopted land. He recalled, I had a guilty conscience. In my films, I championed the cause of the gentle, the poor, the downtrodden, yet I had begun to live like the Aga Khan, which apparently is like upper-class leaders in Muslim communities. He's just saying he's he's living high and high on the hog and not and not living out the principles that he puts in his films. Anyway, yada yada. The curse of Hollywood is big money. It comes so fast, it breeds and imposes its own mores, not of wealth, but of ostentation and phony status. So he went to war. 
Capra was the head of the army's section, a special section on morale. He directed and co-directed seven documentary war films. The series of films was titled Why We Fight and consisted of Prelude to War, The Nazis Strike, Divide and Conquer, The Battle of Britain, The Battle of Russia, The Battle of China, and War Comes to America. He also made six others apart from this series. Prelude to War won the 1942 Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature, and in 1945, Capra was discharged from the Army as a colonel. Having been awarded the World War I Victory Medal for his service in World War I, the Legion of Merit, the Distinguished Service Medal, the American Defense Service Medal, the American Campaign Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal. After the war, Capra teamed up with fellow directors William Wyler and George Stevens to found Liberty Films Studio. It was the first independent company of directors since the United Artist in Artists in 1919. Liberty Films, however, would only go on to produce two films, It's a Wonderful Life in 1946 and State of the Union in 1948. It's a Wonderful Life would prove to be Capra's final directorial success, but he didn't know that at the time. The film It's a Wonderful Life was adapted from a story called The Greatest Gift by the author Philip Van Doren Stern, which was written in 1939, but rejected by publishers. He later turned the story into a 24-page pamphlet, printed 200 copies, and mailed them to his friends and family for Christmas in 1943. RKO found the story either by Cary Grant or his agent, something, anyway. RKO bought the rights of the story to the story in April of 1944 for $10,000, hoping to turn it into a vehicle for Cary Grant. The Greatest Gift was about a man who becomes despondent. His, name, his first name was George, but his last name was something else in the original story. He becomes very despondent and cynical about life in general and attempts to find, much like the film, and is taught by an angel that the greatest gift is life itself, which is why it's called The Greatest Gift. What a nice sentiment for Christmas, right? Screenwriters Dalton Trumbo, Clifford o O'Day or Odets, O-D-E-T-S, I don't know, and Mark Connolly all worked to adapt a script before RKO ended up shelving the project. Trumbo's script was about a politician, George Bailey, so there's the name, who attempts something after losing an election and is shown by an angel not how his community would be different had he never been born, but how his life would be different had he gone into business instead of politics. Which I feel like kind of takes a lot of the heart out of the story. It's kind of weird. I'm glad they didn't go with that. Sorry, Trumbo. <laughs> RKO chief Charles Corner sent the original story along to Frank Capra later on, and Frank was eager to make it his first project after the war. He bought the rights to the story, and RKO gave him the first three versions of the screenplay. Taking bits of Trumbo and O'Day's scripts, Capra brought on writers Francis Goodrich, Albert Hackett, Joe Swirling, J-O, a woman, Joe Swirling, Michael Wilson, and Dorothy Parker. Dorothy Parker was brought on to polish up the script at the end. Goodrich later recalled of the creative process. He called Capra that horrid man. It seemed Capra wanted to write it himself, and the writers he had brought on felt rushed and disrespected. Why did you hire us if you're gonna... I'm not sure if his hiring them was mostly his own idea or if it was someone else's idea, but he didn't seem to want their help. Hackett called him a very arrogant son of a... <clears throat> you know. This brouhaha resulted, of course, in a dispute over writing credits. Surprise, surprise. It was finally credited to Goodrich, 
Hackett and Capra with additional scenes by Joe Swirling. As far as the casting, both Jimmy Stewart and his dear friend Henry Fonda were considered for the role of George Bailey, but for Capra only one man was fit for the job. He would write in his autobiography, Of all the actor's roles, I believe the most difficult is the role of a good Sam who doesn't know he is a good Sam. I think he meant Samaritan, but it says Sam. He shortened it for some reason. I don't know. Anyway, so he said that, and then he said, I know one man who could play it, James Stewart. Capra spoke to the MCA agent who dealt with Stewart, Lou Wasserman, asking him to pass along the story to Jimmy, but Jimmy said he would gladly take the role without hearing it first. So he was like, Capra wants me? Great. Sure. He'd already worked for him twice before. He liked him. That would be his first role after World War II as well. Several actresses were considered for the crucial role of Mary Bailey, including past co-star Jean Arthur. She turned it down, however, as she was suffering fatigue from a stage role at the time. Ginger Rogers was also considered for it, and she turned it down as well, considering the story too bland. She later regretted that decision. Olivia de Havilland was also considered. Uh, I'm not sure what happened with that. Finally, they decided to borrow Donna Reed from MGM, which was kind of a perfect choice, given the film's timing right after World War II, and the subject matter, which includes George's brother, Harry, being in the war, because the, the film was supposed to be set at that time. And Donna Reed was especially perfect for it due to something that I'm going to read to you about. There is an article from 2017 called Dear Donna Reed from CBS. It's a Wonderful Life season is here again, starring, along with Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed. The backstory of this 1946 Christmas classic is World War II, just over and still haunting its cast and the country. For Mary Owen, Donna Reed's daughter, the war and the movie will always be connected. Every year before some showings, she reads letters her mother received from soldiers and sailors during World War II. It's for people of your character and caliber that we are fighting for. Sincerely, Private Joseph F. DeStoli. Owen found the letters after her mother died in 1986, more than 350 of them, carefully saved for more than 40 years. It was nice to read them all at once, Owen said, because it captured almost like the pinup culture. These women were almost like talisman that these men were pinning up in their barracks to get them through the war and to remind them what they were fighting for. Only 20 years old, when the United States entered World War II in 1941, Reed, along with the rest of Hollywood, joined the war effort. On September 16, 1942, she wrote to her lifelong pen pal, I'm investing 10%, but I feel that isn't very much. So this week I joined the Hollywood Canteen, which enables me to entertain soldiers at the Hollywood USO at least one night a week for three hours. It was for servicemen only. Between 1942 and 1945, more than three million came to see the biggest names in show business. Stars didn't just put on shows. They served meals, signed autographs, and danced with anybody who asked. Actress Marsha Hunt, which at the time of this art article was 100 years old, was a regular on Saturday nights. Teichner, who wrote the article, I assume, asked her, was it flattering to you? Or was it uncomfortable to be touched by so many people? You know, she's dancing with these servicemen. No, I understood it was fame, said Hunt. They were dancing with fame, not with Marsha Hunt. It was a privilege to be among them and to give them a lift of morale, which it certainly did. I guess there might have been some pride in it because you weren't sure that any of them would ever come home. And so you did that little thing, you signed your silly name, and it seemed to matter to them and to their folks back home. Practically everyone who wrote to Donna Reed wanted a signed photograph, 
Soldier Glenn Peterson grew up 30 miles from Denison, Iowa, where Reed was from. She signed a portrait to Glenn, my neighbor from Iowa. Jerry Peterman, a volunteer archivist at the Donna Reed Foundation for the Performing Arts in Denison, showed Teichner a picture of the farmhouse where Reed was born, her parents standing at the front gate. It was always the girl next door, said Peterman, who added Reed's wholesome image was real. Owen read another letter from the troops dated August 18, 1944. We think you are the typical American girl, someone whom we'd like to come home to. One group of soldiers wrote that they wanted her to be their squadron angel. They also sent bad poetry, and sometimes their brave jokey letters belied their terror. With you as our movie girlfriend, I imagine we'll survive. The old shoeboxes Mary Owen found were filled with the hopes and fears and fantasies of soldiers whose dreams of Donna Reed were a gift whose value she understood and treasured. Dear Private Davidson, you say that I am the kind of girl you'd like to come home to. That is the finest compliment I have ever been paid. Whew. Anyway, <laughs> gets ya. So, that being said, she was perfect for the role of Mary for numerous reasons. Lionel Barrymore was one of many considered for the role of Mr. Potter, and he was a particularly natural choice as he was at the time a frequent Ebenezer Scrooge in radio productions. Beulah Bondi, who played the Bailey matriarch, had also played James Stewart's mother in three prior films, Vivacious Lady and Of Human Hearts, both in 1938, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington in 1939. She would play his mother again in an episode of The Jimmy Stewart Show in 1971. Thomas Mitchell, who played Uncle Billy, had also been in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and his pet in It's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy the Raven, had first appeared in the other Capra Stewart film, You Can't Take It With You, and after that he appeared in every subsequent Capra film. Every single one. The bird died sometime after 1954, and between the 30s and 50s, he had appeared in approximately 1,000 feature films in all. Jimmy Stewart said of The Raven that he was the smartest actor on the set, requiring fewer retakes than his human counterparts. Let's see if I can do this properly. This is intimidating. <laughs> Robert J. Anderson played young George Bailey, Billed in the film as Bobby Anderson. He left acting in the 50s, but stayed in the industry working as a production manager, director, and producer. Oh no. Oh no, no, no. This is gonna get too tacky. Crap. I forgot to do my mascara! <laughs> it's a Wonderful Life was shot at RKO Radio Picture Studios, and the set covered four acres of an 89-acre movie ranch in Encino, California. RKO's head of special effects, Russell Shearman, had to develop a special kind of snow for the movie. Up to that point, movie snow was typically made of untoasted, not unstarched, <laughs> starch, oh my word, untoasted cornflakes. And they were so loud to walk on that dialogue in scenes with it had to be redubbed in post. So Russell Shearman developed this special kind of chemical snow made with water, soap flakes, some substance called fomite, and sugar. I feel like you like won an award for that or something. I forgot to look that up. <laughs> Filming of It's a Wonderful Life began April 15th, tax day! <laughs> 1946, and wrapped on July 27th, 1946, exactly on the deadline for the 90-day principal photography schedule. Impressive! Only two film locations still exist. The swimming pool from the high school dance scene, which many people at the time scoffed at, saying that was not real. It was totally real. It 
was located in a gymnasium of an actual high school, the Beverly Hills High School. And then the other location that still survives, I believe still at this point, was the Martini home. Martini family, they build them the house, the Bailey building and loan, in La Cañada, Flint Ridge, Can Canada. It was <laughs> Cañada, makes me want to say Canada. <laughs> California. It was in California. La Cañada, Flint Ridge, California. The movie ranch, the 89-acre movie ranch in Encino was demolished in 1954. The scene in the film where young George saves his brother Harry had been quite different in an earlier draft. Instead of sledding down the hill onto the ice, the group of boys is playing hockey and George accidentally hits the puck onto Mr. Potter's property, at which point Mr. Potter sets dogs on them and George, not George, Harry falls through the ice trying to run away and that's when George saves him, gets sick, gets the infection in his ear, loses hearing in his ear, blah blah blah. Bobby Anderson, who played young George, said that in the drugstore scene where Mr. Gower, played by H.B. Warner, slaps him in the ear, the slaps were real and he legitimately made his ear bleed and obviously cry, hence the very realistic reactions from Bobby. Warner was kind of contrite afterward and hugged Anderson after. I don't know if that really makes things better, um, but the scene, it works. It definitely works. It makes me tear up. If for some reason you're not familiar with it, I'm just going to spoil it for you. What are you doing with your life that you haven't watched It's a Wonderful Life yet? Mr. Gower finds out that his son had died. He's really upset. He accidentally puts poison in capsules, he's a pharmacist, and sends George off to deliver to a family of sick children. And George knows it's poison and he doesn't know what to do. And he comes back to the drugstore and Mr. Gower is getting phone calls from this family who has very sick children and he's legitimately concerned that George has not shown up with the medicine yet. And he, because he's also upset about his child that had passed away, I mean his adult son. He's just completely distraught and he gets, he loses his temper and hits George and George promises that he would never tell anybody what had happened because obviously if George hadn't noticed that he had accidentally put poison in the capsules instead of the visually identical medicine, those kids would have died, which is a plot point that comes up later. So anyway, <laughs> It's a really good scene. Uh, the filming of it, uh, I can't say it was super duper ethical. Slapping a kid around, actually. Uh, not the best thing ever. Oh my word, okay, apparently I can't use those things and I have to use my fingers. The composer of the film was named Dimitri Tiamkin, and he had a falling out with Capra during the filming. They had worked on many films before and had up to that point had a good relationship but Capra was refusing to use the music he had written for the film, and this upset him, obviously. He felt like he was just being discarded. So this was his first negative experience with Capra, and they uh, were not super friendly after that point. In the homecoming party scene for George's brother Harry and his new wife, Ruth, Uncle Billy stumbles off set drunk, and moments later, a crash is heard, as though Uncle Billy had run into and knocked over a bunch of trash cans and Jimmy, as George, is seen standing there in the frame surprised at first and then smiling because Thomas Mitchell, playing Uncle Billy, ad-libbed this line I'm all right, I'm all right. So what had actually happened, however, this was not planned, some poor technician knocked over a bunch of equipment and Thomas Mitchell, thankfully, ad-libbed that line because this technician thought he was going to lose his job and instead he got a $10 bonus, which today would be just under $142. It is very funny and it's even funnier knowing that it was not planned. I mean, Thomas Mitchell's ad-lib of I'm alright was so well done and Jimmy's reaction was so natural that it just really worked. Hallelujah for that poor technician who thought he was going to lose his job. Because it was right after the war 
and James Stewart had actually been involved in quite a bit of combat, um, he was not extremely confident in his abilities as an actor anymore. He had really just started becoming famous right before the war. He was determined to enlist, but then he had post-traumatic stress disorder. He had a really rough time. He lost people in missions, and he didn't really talk a lot about his service. He really struggled, but he was able to draw on that quite a bit in the film when he is seen at the bridge getting ready to jump off and he doesn't know what to do, that he really drew on that trauma. And when he comes back to the bridge, after he sees what his life would be like, begging, he wants to live again, all of these things that happen to him, those very emotional scenes. He's a very desperate person in the film. He learned to go from rote reciting of his lines and acting. It's not like he was a was not a good actor before. He was an excellent actor before, but his experiences in the war really gave him a new emotional depth. You know, when he proposes to Mary and he gets really upset before making out with her, basically, and he hadn't really done a lot of super romantic scenes up to that point in his career. So he was very nervous about that, but it turned out very well, obviously. Popular scene. It was an issue for him, and he was not super confident about his abilities to pull that off, but it seemed to really add a lot of depth. And it's fantastic. Just fantastic. You really see his desperation. Just so many layers of emotions to it. It was not a shallow film. There were several alternate endings considered, including George falling to his knees to recite the Lord's Prayer, which would echo the beginning of the film with the townspeople reciting it which was also changed to a loop of George's family and friends, lifting him up in prayer, leading to the commission of Clarence Abbott, Angel's second class, to help him in an effort to earn his wings. It was felt that the Lord's Prayer at the beginning and end had too strong a religious tone and undermined the emotional impact of George's family and friends coming to his rescue. The film premiered in New York on December 20th, 1946 to mixed reviews. Capra felt that the critical reviews of the time all skewed negative, but Time said It's a Wonderful Life is a pretty wonderful movie. It has only one formidable rival as Hollywood's best picture of the year. Director Capra's inventiveness, humor, and affection for human beings keep it glowing with life and excitement. Bosley Crowther, who wrote for the New York Times, said of it, the weakness of this picture, from this reviewer's point of view, is the sentimentality of it. It's a illusory concept of life. Mr. Capra's nice people are charming, his small town is a quite beguiling place, and his pattern for solving problems is most optimistic and facile. But somehow they all resemble theatrical attitudes rather than average realities. Well, bah humbug to you too, Bosley Crowther. Snob. Too sentimental. What's wrong with being sentimental anyway, huh? I'm a pretty sentimental person. The film's release in 1946 had likely hurt its chances at the Academy Awards, having more stiff competition than it than if it had been released the following year as originally planned. Only one, one award. Here's where it gets a little interesting too. The FBI released a memo in on May 26, 1947, stating, <laughs> "With regard to the picture, it's a wonderful life." redacted, a person, stated in substance that the film represented rather obvious attempts to discredit bankers by casting Lionel Barrymore as a Scrooge type, so that he would be the most hated man in the picture. This, according to these sources, is a common trick used by communists. In addition, redacted stated that, in his opinion, this picture deliberately maligned the upper class, attempting to show the people who had money were mean and despicable characters. Well, I think Redacted was an idiot. How whiny does that sound? Yeah, it makes it seem like mean, mean people and despicable characters. Like, oh, for crying out loud. Censors are the worst. So aside from being against censorship in general, it's just a wrong critique all the way around. George Bailey's entire life in the film was devoted to lifting people out of poverty, not attacking the wealthy. 
The end of the film shows his old rich schoolmate Sam Wainwright wiring thousands of dollars in aid of his friend George. George did not seek wealth, he sought adventure and meaning. Money just happens to be somewhat necessary to travel. <laughs> it was also noted by film historian Andrew Saris, Saris that it was kind of ironic that the censors did not seem to notice that the miser Potter gets away with the robbery without being caught or punished in any way. That wasn't the point of the film. The lesson of the film is not that having money or possessions is bad. <laughs> On the contrary, it shows celebrations of characters' worldly success throughout the film, like the martinis being able to afford a home and climbing out of poverty. The lesson of the movie is that our purpose and meaning are derived from our relationships and what we do with what we have. And that's all I really have for you. Except lipstick. I have lipstick for you. Look at mine with just this little bit. Boop. I get all my lipstick on before my battery dies. That is a question. <sighs> it's a little bit of a like Joan Crawford lip. Let's, let's go with that. Because we're in the 40s, yeah? That is all I have for you. That is a little bit of the story of James Stewart leading up to the making of that movie and a little bit of the story of Frank Capra leading up to that movie and then a little bit of why Donna Reed's casting in that movie was so perfect. If you have never seen it before, go watch it. Seriously, what are you doing? It is such a fantastic movie. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas or Hanukkah. Thankfully, it's kind of a Christmas movie, but it's really just a human movie. It's a human story. Some people had terrible things to say about it as far as how dark it kind of was because of George Bailey attempting something. But that's what makes it so real. Sure, there were, there's idealism in the movie, and maybe the solutions in it are a little too simplistic, but it's true. It's true. What really helps people more than just taking care of each other and connection? Like I said, the lesson is that relationships and the, what we do with what we have, not what we have, but what we do with it, is really what counts. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season, whether you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah or any other Thing or don't celebrate anything at all. I hope you find meaning and purpose in your own life, and I will see you next time. Bye! Stay hydrated, kids. I am Flemmy.